The following podcast is taken from a live broadcast on Inspire FM. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. You're listening to uh, Inspire FM 105.1 FM. This is Friday Night Live with me, Zafar Iqbal. The headlines uh, this week, um, Parliament has been prorogued. If you listened to our programme last week, you would have known what prorogued means. Effectively, effectively it's been shut down. Bipin Rawat, India's general, says he's ready to take Azad Kashmir, if the politicians say. And Mugabe, the leader of Zimbabwe, died aged 90. He was the sole leader uh, for many years, since the, the, the 90s when Zimbabwe became independent, uh, and he's died this week. Right, okay, these were the headlines. Uh, you're listening to Inspire FM, Friday Night Live. Uh, the date, I guess, is 13th of September. If you're listening on Friday evening, uh, if you're listening on Saturday afternoon, uh, then obviously it's not. You'll listen to a repeat, and I'm sure you will find it just as enjoyable if you're listening to a repeat. Stay tuned. Uh, and guess, I guess what's lined up for today uh, for you, like um, previous occasions, is a, a packed show full of interesting international and local news, views, uh, and other types of stories which might be maybe of interest to yourselves. Uh, so today we're going to uh, talk about, I guess we're going to talk about the ongoing un- unrest in, uh, in Kashmir, um, the Indian side of Kashmir. There's more headlines, uh, one of those which I read out. Um, the other one uh, is headlines from the, uh, the Pakistani side, um, the foreign minister, um, Mr. Shah, said that, that there's a possibility of an accidental war between India and Pakistan should things progress uh, as they are at the moment. Um, I said parliament has been prorogued um, and has Boris Johnson broken a law by suspending parliament effectively, proroguing it. Maybe suspension is not the right word, but in effect, they've been told to leave parliament uh, for five weeks. Uh, and then we're, go- we're going to talk about um, transplants, uh, organ transplants in Islam. Um, we're going to have somebody who is a doctor uh, and uh, an expert in this area. Uh, but we're going to start off today, uh, inshallah, with, with a story, an international story. Uh, and this is um, basically a story which has been brewing for the last uh, good few weeks, I would say, if, if not months. Uh, there have been protests in Hong Kong um, against what it was originally uh, a law that the Hong Kong, Hong Kong um, I'm not sure it's right to say parliament, but the, the governing body within Hong Kong passed a law which allowed mainland, mainland China to extradite or take away uh, criminals away from Hong Kong. So if you're, if you're familiar with history, uh, Hong Kong used to be uh, an independent territory, uh, well, in- independent as much as it could have been, because I think it was a British territory, British overseas territory. Uh, and then Britain did, a, uh, I think it was a 90-year deal or, or whatever, uh, and handed it over to the Chinese with the agreement that, that it was retain a semi-independent status with its own legislative body uh, up until 2050, I think. Uh, so in some essences, I think defense and, and stuff is looked after by China, uh, but pretty much everything else is run by this governing organization. Um, now, um, there appears to be some disagreement, uh, where, you know, with, with this, this particular law that was passed, uh, and there have been protests and riots and, um, and generally, a lot of people out there dis- disgruntled with the way the Chinese uh, are dealing with the situation. Um, and some of these these protests are, are very well organised. Um, and and we're gonna we're gonna talk about the I guess the uh, the situation on the ground as it is at the moment, rather than historical point of view. Uh, I have on the line uh, Sophie Richardson, and uh, she's the China director of Human Rights Watch. Uh, hi, Sophie. Welcome to Inspire FM. Hi, it's good to be. Thanks, it's good to be with you. Thank you very much for taking the time to speak to us. I, I understand it's very late where you are, so I do 
really appreciate you taking the time out and, and uh, giving us uh, an update on, on this very important, I say, an issue, uh, which has been bro- brewing for a number of months. Uh, uh, what, what's the latest and what's, what's um, uh, even though this particular, particularly contentious law has been removed, uh, the protests continue. Uh, can you give us an update, please? Sure, you're correct that, uh, in a way, the most concrete development is that last week the Hong Kong government formally withdrew the proposed extradition bill. Mm. But I think that was just too little and too late. Over the last three months, demonstrations have gone from focusing specifically on that bill to much broader concerns that have been percolating in Hong Kong for quite some time about everything from income inequality to the overreach by Chinese judicial authorities into Hong Kong system, such that, you know, protesters aren't just angry anymore about this bill. They've got a much longer list of demands, and it seems unlikely that they will stop protesting uh, while they feel they've still got some room to press the government for more concessions. Mm. You say that they've got a much bigger set of grievances, uh, watching televisions, we've seen some of the p- protesters um, basically putting the British flag back on again uh, on on their you know, their legislative um, uh, organisation or body. Uh, is there is there a fear that 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 um, I guess the particular identity of the people of Hong Kong, which in some ways has a resonance within UK or linked to, to the UK uh, from a cultural point of view and I guess from a historical point of view. Uh, is there a longing to be part of that, that old system again or what, what's, the, well, what's the key driver? Is it, is it China's, uh, I guess, um, lack of democratic credentials or is it longing for an, a system that's gone by? Yeah, I think it's not necessarily nostalgia for the British colonial era, but rather that Hong Kong people have a strong and distinct identity separate from the mainland. And that in many ways, uh, the steps the Chinese government has taken, you know, everywhere from insisting that the Chinese national anthem be sung at the beginning of football matches through to its unwillingness to allow people in Hong Kong to pursue democratic elections the way you know, by law, they're entitled to. Mm. You know, all of these maneuvers have really done, I think, what happens to lots of people worldwide when they're told that they can't, uh, you know, maintain their distinct identity, which is that it makes them dig in that much more to try to mm. protect it. Uh, and so, you know, you've seen these extraordinary creative you know, and, and overwhelmingly peaceful gestures of people, for example, repurposing uh, you know, songs or hymns that are very popular in Hong Kong to sort of refashion them as sure. anthems to the protesters or, you know, to use those distinct markers of Hong Kong identity, um, you know, as a way of asserting that distinction from mm. Beijing. And I, I, think, I think the Chinese would argue that, that the agreement they had um, with Britain to retain a distinct identity for Hong Kong in the 90s um, is I guess is drawing to a, a close. I guess yeah, I think the the lease or the the term of that expires in another twenty years or so, and and this could be seen in a in a well, way of of uh, I guess normalizing the two systems and the two sort of uh, two cultures. I guess could it not? Well, I mean the 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 laws that you're talking about or the agreement that you're talking about uh, says that Hong Kong should maintain its distinct identity for at least 50 years. 50, yes, right, yeah. But it doesn't say that it automatically comes to a grinding halt at right, the, right, in, okay. in 2047. It, it says this is, you know, this is up for discussion. But I think Beijing is making very clear what it wants to yes, see by yes. 2047. Yeah. And the protesters are saying that's not what they have in mind. Mm, and, you mm-hmm. know, they're striving now, I think, to assert what they can while they can. Mm. So that, that in, in some ways that makes sense. The Chinese are looking to... 2047 and saying, right, okay, we've got two systems, we need to merge them, make it into a one system, and that system is going to be the Chinese system. Uh, and then you've got the protesters saying, uh-uh, uh, not quite. Uh, and then that's where, right. I guess, that's where the, the, the crux of the, the, the disagreement is, I guess, between the protesters. And I have seen that the, the protesters seem to be using very, uh, 
uh, uh, very, I guess, very unique tactics, uh, you know, in terms of the way they protest and targeting the airports and other facilities, uh, etc. Well, but also creative, I think, in that you know, there isn't uh, there isn't a stated or named leader. Um, that these decisions about protests are made by very fluid groups of people who sure. are using social media and other forms of technology in very sophisticated ways. Um, you know, and do you think it, 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 it bears mention that these protests have been overwhelmingly peaceful, if you think about the sheer numbers of people who have been out on the streets sure. over the course of the last several weeks? There's certainly been some incidents uh, of violence, but frankly, the ones about which we're extremely concerned are the ones in which police appear to have used excessive force, which sure. is a significant change from policing in Hong Kong 5, 10, 15 years ago, and one about which we're quite concerned. Sure. Okay. And I, I guess that that's you as a China Director of Human Rights Watch is, is your main concern, the fact that the human rights abuses are not carried out. And, and you're seeing, you've given some examples, but is there any other examples where, where you, you, you're actually either um, uh, know of or fear uh, perhaps rights abuses happening in, in Hong Kong? Yeah, we've been writing about erosions to rights for probably 10 or 15 years in Hong Kong now. And, you know, back in, <laughs> back in, in slightly simpler times, those were issues that related to things like uh, increasing constraints on media freedom, for example, you know, or occasional violent attacks on journalists or other kind of activists. But mm. some of the bigger threats are more systemic. For example, the failure to make progress towards universal suffrage. Sure. But now, increasingly, what we see are fairly um, brass-knuckled tactics mm. by uh, authorities from the central government to do things like reach into court cases and intervene in those before they've even exhausted their course in Hong Kong courts. Well. You know, for the first time in the last few years, Hong Kong has had what we would consider political prisoners, people who have been prosecuted simply because they exercise their right to free speech. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there have been a series of very worrying cases of people being uh, kidnapped, essentially, from the mainland, including booksellers, uh, you know, to uncertain fates inside the mainland, uh, you know, suggesting that police in Hong Kong aren't or can't protect uh, people who live in the territory who are known critics of the Chinese government. Those are very worrying trends. Mm, indeed, indeed. So I think these are trends... Uh, in a way to try and muzzle freedom of speech, I, think, I guess, and that that will be the main uh, main thrust of of their the Chinese, um, I, I guess, approach, because that that's the one thing that goes counter to sort of their particular particular system, where the the, the voice is not necessarily heard in the way that is heard uh, in Hong Kong. So I, 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 I think it's one of. A, a, a series of areas of intolerance. I mean, look, the Chinese Communist Party loathes alternative forms of organizing, you know, whether that's an identity like Hong Kong's, hmm. uh, you know, as a, as a distinct place uh, or, or heritage, particularly linguistic one, whether it's about uh, a religious identity, for example, for the Uyghur population. That's right, yes. That's, uh, right. that's predominantly Muslim in the western part of the country, whether it's you know, small civil society groups that are organizing for, you know, the public good. The Chinese Communist Party is quite hostile to any of these. And mm -hmm. so I think it, it's particularly unhappy at seeing huge numbers of people out on the street for all the world's media to see, particularly in the run-up to October 1st, which is the 70th anniversary of the founding of the People's Republic of China. Mm, indeed, indeed. And, and I guess I think you mentioned the Uyghur people. I mean, they're, they're, the, the situation there is... is, is well, from, from what's been spoken about, much worse. It's, 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 it's more indoctrination and it's more, uh, it's not a question of, you know, uh, freedom of speech anymore. It's, it's basically no freedom whatsoever by, by what's, what's been written about that particular region. The situation in Xinjiang is nothing short of appalling. Mm. This is uh, a human rights violation of a scope and scale we have not seen inside China. Since the uh, Tiananmen massacre in 1989, we estimate that somewhere in the neighborhood of a million, a million. Uh, ethnic, ethnic Turkic Muslims are being arbitrarily detained 
well. and forcibly subjected to political indoctrination simply because they are Muslims with a distinct cultural identity. But, and but Chinese authorities seem to think that they can expropriate a justification and make the case that these people are somehow uh, national security threats or potential terrorists or separatists mm -hmm. and reprogram them into being loyal servants of the Chinese Communist Party. And the fact that many governments around the world have failed to speak up in the face of this breathtaking yes, supporting, human rights violation is very disturbing. Indeed, indeed. Uh, so I guess the final question would be that uh, uh, fr from your perspective, and I think you continue to sort of write and raise your voices, but uh, Chinese authority, would they be listening? Would they listen? Is there is there anything to, to make them listen to, to change their mind on, on these things? Well, I think the extradition law would not have been, or bill would not have been withdrawn had there not been significant public protest. Uh, yeah. And in that sense, you know, these protesters scored an enormous win. Beijing does not blink often. Mm, indeed, and the indeed. question is whether, you know, they can try to secure some additional gains that, frankly, are largely about ensuring rights to which they are entitled under international law. Indeed, indeed. Sophie Richardson, thank you very much uh, for your contribution today. It's been very enlightening. Uh, and I know it's very late, thank so we'll, we'll let you go. Thank you very much indeed. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you indeed. Uh, listeners, uh, if you want to sort of take part in our discussion today, our number is 01582481822. Or if you want to text and WhatsApp us, uh, it's 0 0777948822. Uh, I'd love to have uh, your feedback, your comments today on any of the topics uh, uh, that we're discussing. It's always, always, uh, I, I guess, um, uh, I guess, useful and 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 uh, and good that that we get participation of the audience because we know then that, that we're we're talking about the right things and um, and we are entertaining as well as informing. So call us today and then give us your view, uh, inshallah, on, on the the topics that we're uh, we're discussing today. So um, next uh, topic, I think part A, part B sort of uh, arrangement, uh, we're going to talk about transplantation, transplantation uh, and Islam. Uh, that's organ transplantation, uh, transplantation uh, I understand. So part one is, is now, uh, and part two would be at 7.30 uh, from the schedule I see ahead of me. Uh, I have on, uh, on the line uh, Dr. Manzoor Ali. He's a lecturer in Islamic studies at Cardiff University, School of History, Archaeology and Religion. Uh, can I welcome you, Dr. Mansoor? Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum as -salam. Yeah, Thank you very much for having me on your show. Uh, yeah, well, welcome to Friday Night Live and, and Inspire FM. Uh, again, thank you very much for taking the time out and, and speaking to us today. Uh, again, it's a very important topic. Uh, not much talked about, I would say, in, in uh, many circles within the, uh, I guess, Muslim Islamic media. A very important topic indeed. Uh, so I, I guess the first question really, really would be um, why why would we want to talk about it now? What's what's the uh, what's the urgency now to talk about this rather than okay. maybe many years ago? Okay, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Um, the reason why we are talking about this and the urgency to talk about this now is yeah. because of the new law right. in England that's coming in, which is called the um, the Dean Consent Law 2019. Yeah. Um, this law has passed uh, royal consent and will become actually law in April 2020. Yeah. Um, the law suggests that if someone wants to um, wants to opt out of their organs means that they don't want to give their organs a post-death, then they have to go onto the NHS website and declare mm. that they don't want their organs uh, to be donated after death. Um, if they don't do that, then it will be deemed, presumed that they have given their consent. So that's why there's a lot of talk going on about this. Okay, so by, by, by default, um, consent is given, so the, the organs will be taken where they are in good shape. Um, and I guess that, that is, is that of a concern to Muslims? Should it be a concern to Muslims or not? Yeah. Uh, personally, I think a lot of people don't understand uh, what, what the new law is about and they don't really understand the mechanics um, of, the, of the law. Uh, first of all, uh, people think that as soon as the new law comes in, they will have no chance of opting out. So you need to opt out now. 
Um, secondly, um, if somebody does not opt out for whatever reason, then then people think that once they die, then there will be no say at all. That's a misunderstanding of the law. Mm. Um, the, the law of deemed consent in the UK is actually what we call a soft opt-out yeah. as opposed to a hard opt-out. A hard opt-out is when family members do not have any say at all if somebody hasn't opted out because the law is with the, uh, with the doctors. Okay. Um, in a soft opt-out, um, there will be no difference than what we have now, which is um, informed consent, mm-hmm. um, where people have to give consent. Family members still will be um, contacted and, and, and a decision will be made based on their consultation. Sure. Um, the only thing is that it makes it easier for um, doctors and um, hospital nurses to have that conversation because the law is on their side. Sure. But also the law, uh, law is coming in because there are, you know, out of half a million people that die in the UK every single year, um, only one in hundred go on to become um, organ donors because of so many factors. Sure. Even if somebody's carrying a organ donor card mm-hmm. and they die, doesn't necessarily mean that they will, you know, their organs will be taken. Because there's so many factors involved. One of the first things is that they need to die in intensive care. The organs have to be um, healthy. On the day there needs to be a match. If there isn't a match on the day, then they won't take the organs because there's no such thing as storing the organs, organs have very short uh, shelf life. Sure. So the new law is basically trying to capture all of those people who believe um, in, in organ donation um, from whatever um, denomination or belief they come from, but they just hadn't ha- haven't had the chance to go and sign the organ donation uh, form because, I don't know, they were b- busy watching the standards or something. Sure. These people are falling through the net. And this new law is trying to capture all of these people. So not a lot of things is going to change, really. Mm. So I, I guess from, a, from an Islamic perspective, uh, from what I understand, uh, the only thing that, that people would, may have hesitation about uh, is the fact that uh, it is widely believed that the, the deceased body uh, feels the pain, that the ruh feels the pain. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and that's, that's the thing that... that uh, uh, and, and I think if you've seen... Um, the way the postmortems are done, and the yeah. way the bodies are cut up, and 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 basically yeah. everything shoved back in, uh, that's yeah. the thing that that would would be a, a prime on on people's minds. Yeah. So uh, when... so you made two points here. One yeah. is about the body feeling pain, uh, yeah. and the other other one is about um, postmortem. So the, those are two 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 things. Yeah. Um, so let let me tackle them one by one. As far as the body feeling pain, this is this is what I call popular theology. This is something which is which is common yeah. uh, amongst people, even amongst ulama. Um, but actually, there is no textual backing for that. Okay. Uh, there is no there is no textual backing for uh, the body actually or the ruh actually feel pain. Um, that's just something that people just assume. Mm. Um, the, the 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 second uh, um, answer to your second question about post mortem, a lot of people have these concerns about post mortem and the way that post mortem is done. What people don't understand is, and I've written about this um, actually, the difference between post mortem and organ extraction. Sure. It's two different things. First of all. Um, post-mortem is done by a pathologist, mm. um, organ extraction or procurement is done by a surgeon. In post-mortem, they need to find the cause of death, and therefore there is no obligation on them to preserve anything. Mm. They're dashing, gnashing to the, into the organs, chop them up, put them back in. But in organ uh, procurement, they're trying to protect those organs, sure. so the surgery is much more precise. Mm. Um, and uh, so, so I mean, uh, the other thing is that in order for a postmortem to happen, the the person has to die outside of hospital. Mm. Okay, um, you can have postmortems where somebody has died inside of the hospital, and the doctors want to find the cause of death, but that's not a legal requirement on the next of kin. But if somebody dies outside of hospital, then it's a legal requirement. Mm-hmm. Whereas in organ uh, uh, transplantation or extraction of organs, somebody has to die in hospital. Um, and not only in hospital, they have to die in intensive care because okay. the organs have a, a short shelf short, life. Short shelf life yeah, um, as, soon as, as soon as somebody dies, you know, yeah. they need to take those organs out because once the body shuts down, 
uh, the, the organs are deprived of oxygen, they become hypoxic, they're no use. Once the cells die, they're no use, so there has to be preparation done. So you can see that there's stark differences between... Yeah, I understand. Um, uh, very very yeah, quickly, I've, I've only got a minute or so. I just wanted to ask you just to reaffirm the per- permissibility of, I guess, transportation, transplantation uh, in Islam. Uh, is it permissible? Well, I've been researching this topic since 2016, and I've uh, I've read over 100 of fatwas, um, and um, I've come up with seven different opinions. I cannot give you an Islam or the Islamic opinion. There is plurality of opinions on from organ donation and reception being haram to organ donation and reception being um, being halal. Okay. My uh, my. Uh, I'm yeah. so, I've, I've run out of time, so I'm afraid. So I think I have to leave it there. I think you made the, the main point, which is that there's a variety of opinions on this. Uh, Dr. Mansur Ali, Jazakallah Khair, thank you very much for your contribution today. Really appreciate okay. it. No thank problem. You. Assalamu alaikum. Okay, take care. Right, listeners, we're going to take a short break and we'll be right back. You're listening to an Inspire FM podcast, making available our popular programs from our daily broadcast on Inspire FM. Welcome, welcome back. You're listening to Inspire FM 105.1 FM. This is Friday Night Live. Uh, my, name is, my name is Zafar Iqbal, and I'm now joined by my very worthy co-host, Abdul Akbar Cooper. Abu Bakr Cooper. Sorry. Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr. Alhamdulillah. How's everybody out there? Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. So uh, we, were, we were talking about um, the Hong Kong protests uh, before you joined, uh, and we talked about... Uh, I I just call it transplants. Transplantation, right? Just sounds doesn't sound right. Transplants in Islam. So we had Dr. Mansur Ali who was talking about transplants, and you have just shown me your organ donor card, Uh and it says, "Yes, I will donate." Why? Why have you chosen to sort of get one out and 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 basically? Um, When I had the I had the details come through. uh, in the last couple of weeks, I had to uh, reapply for a new driving license because every 10 years you have to do a new one. And uh, it came through with the information. And like and like you were saying earlier on the show, um, you had to make the choice whether or not to opt out. And I, I sat there and looked at it. And um, I did some I did some research and did some found some information online um, with Brit, um, British scholars saying that um, it was allowed. So then I stopped and, th- and I thought about it and I thought, oh, yeah, because I've heard things about Islamic opinions saying no. But um, I have come across uh, plenty of Islamic opinion- opinions uh, saying that it's OK. So I stopped and thought about it and I thought, well, what would be like the as a scientist, uh, I would say, what would be like the acid test or the litmus test or the universal indicator test? And I thought, well, if it was for one of my own children, would I say no mm, to a mm. kidney for one of my children if they needed it, or a heart transplant if I needed it? And uh, of course, in my mind, I thought, no, I wouldn't say no. So then I, I, I stopped and thought about it, and I thought, well, the scholars are saying it's fine. Um, so I thought, well, if if I'd accept it for my own children, why, well, you know, don't be a hypocrite, accept it and and carry the card, and. Uh, Alhamdulillah, the, the way I look at it, if Islam says it's says it's allowed, then fine, why not do it? Indeed, indeed. I think it's a brave decision. I think the fact that you, you used to be a doctor before, did that make your decision easier? Or the fact that you've come across cases like that or uh, in, in your professional life? Or, or is, is it just a you thought about it, you thought about it for a minute, and then you did a bit of a discussion? Well, I'll, I'll be honest, for, for years, I, you know, scholars were only saying, um, you know, back in the 90s when I became Muslim, all I heard was that uh, organ donation was not allowed. Mm. Um, the situation's changed now a little bit. Well, things change, and of course the, the, the scholars get the better of appraisal of the situation. Mm. Um, and of course, as everything with islam we're not scholars and and if you come across um scholars saying that it's, it's allowed then um at the end of the day why not right it, we're, get, we, we're, we're going to move on to the next topic uh which which is of course we're, we're talking about uh, the unrest in kashmir 
Uh, if you were listening to us in the previous uh, sessions, we talked about the ongoing unrest. We call it unrest, but it's actually a, a siege of, of the, the Kashmiri people on the Indian side. India has decided to basically revoke the, uh, I guess, a, a semi-autonomous status of Kashmir uh, and is now uh, uh, effectively ruling it directly from, from Delhi. Um, so that's the status, um, and the people have been sort of, in, in a sense, there's been media uh, and communications blackout. Uh, not many people are what's going on uh, uh, on the ground. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, in, the, 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 in the whole atmosphere, uh, there's been lots of trading of, uh, I guess, threats and extreme words between Pakistan and, and India. Uh, and then two of the ones that I caught my head, uh, eyes, uh, so caught my eye in, in the headlines was um, India's general um, Bipin Rawat said that he was ready to take the Pakistani side of Kashmir as well, uh, if the politicians say so. And I think the, the the politicians who are in power at the moment, I think they're probably they're more likely to say yes than no. Uh, but also on the Pakistani side, uh, the the foreign minister warned uh, that there could be an accidental war between India and Pakistan. So. Uh, I have on the line uh, Michael Kugelman. Uh, he's the Deputy Director and Senior Associate for South Asia Program. Uh, welcome, uh, 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 Michael Kugelman, to, to Inspire FM and Final Life. Thank you for, for joining us today. Well, thank you. Good to be here with you. Uh, indeed. Uh, so I think we, you, you've been with us before, and I think we appreciate yours. Uh, the conversations with yourselves previously on, on other issues related to South Asia. Uh, so I just wanted perhaps your comment on whether these headlines uh, were just, just is rhetoric or is there any, any risk of, of war between the two countries? Well, I do think at least at this point, um, what we're hearing is, is rhetoric uh, and nothing more. Uh, you know, there have been many times in the past, as you know, when India and Pakistan have faced a lot of tensions in their relationships, and you typically have this type of saber rattling and bluster um, coming from both sides of the border, so to speak. So, for example, for, you know, for Pakistan to um, suggest that there there could be the risk of a nuclear war, and that's actually nothing new to hear. You, you hear that quite frequently. Um, and also, um, you know, the, the threat that's been attributed to the Indian uh, military chief about this notion of trying to uh, lay claim to Pakistan-administered Kashmir, that's also rhetoric that's mm. been heard before. Um, though it, what, what may be a little bit different this time is that, um, you know, the move that India made to revoke Article 370, that was an inherently escalatory move from the uh, perspective of Pakistan, just because, as you know, Pakistan has long viewed Jammu and Kashmir as um, as its own territory, sure. that suggests that relations are at a particularly uh, tense moment now. Mm -hmm. And that means that when you have this heated rhetoric, as you typically do, but if you have it now when things are a bit more tense to start with, the chances of some type of miscalculation leading mm -hmm. to an escalation and even a conflict certainly cannot be ruled out. Sure. Okay. So I, I guess there is a risk, but the risk has increased slightly. But uh, we're not at a point where... where the fingers are on, on the triggers. Yeah, that's 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 correct. And, you know, I think it's important to, to keep in mind that neither country, Pakistan or India, has an interest uh, in provoking some type of conflict, particularly Pakistan, which at the moment is suffering through a very serious economic crisis, so it literally cannot afford to, to have a war. And mm -hmm. the other thing is that Pakistan's um, conventional military forces are far inferior to those of India. Um, and India itself, uh, I really don't think, has an interest in any type of, of conflict. Uh, mm -hmm. Certainly India has shown in recent months that it is not, it, it's perfectly willing to engage in uh, retaliatory use of the force when it feels provoked, such as when there's a, a, an attack on its soldiers that it attributes to Pakistan. But uh, I, I, I hope I'm not being too complacent, but my view is that we're not yet at a point where we really seriously have to worry about some type of hot war or a major conflict between these two states. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think some commentators uh, would actually say that, that um, the fact that what's happening in Kashmir um, and, and I guess that the blockade of the Kashmiris uh, in some ways is putting pressure on Pakistan to act um, in some ways, in response to, I guess, cries for help from, from across 
the the LOC. Uh, would that not be, uh, I guess, a reason enough to box for Pakistan to start something? Well, no, I mean, you make a good point that, uh, you know, what's happening in Kashmir is extremely worrisome for Pakistan, uh, not just because of the revocation of Article 370, but also the conditions on the ground in, in, in Kashmir and the, the heavy-handed tactics being used by India, which Pakistan regards as an occupation. Uh, you know, that does suggest to me that Kashmir, genuine Kashmir, which has long been a powder keg, you know, could could well explode in a way that that could make Pakistan feel it should do something. But you know, again, Pakistan doesn't have few options. It doesn't mm-hmm. really have the serious option of say sending troops into sure. into India administered Kashmir. That that wouldn't work. So at this point, at least, what Pakistan has been focusing on is actually a diplomatic campaign to try to attract more support and sympathy from key world capitals and key global forums the issue of, of, of Kashmir. It's been doing that very heavily. It's really going to intensify that effort with the UN General Assembly meetings coming up where Prime Minister Imran Khan will, I'm sure, make a very impassioned speech on Kashmir, hoping that the world will be listening. But at this point, at least, I think that Pakistan's options are restricted to the, the diplomatic path. Sure. Okay. And, and do you think the approach that Pakistan is taking is getting traction from the, the wider community? Because if it feels that it's not getting attraction from the wider community, then it might, it might, I guess, um, resort to the, I guess, the, the, the lower down options uh, in their sort of list of things. Yeah, you're right. It's a good point. Uh, certainly, I think Pakistan is not satisfied. They're getting the type of support and sympathy that it would like to get, and that's because, quite frankly, you know, India India tends to have more trust and favorability on the global stage than Pakistan does. Pakistan's mm. image, its global image, is not a good one. There's not a lot of trust in Pakistan because of its the, the long-standing relations between the state and and militant groups. Um, so, you know, that said, if Pakistan feels its diplomatic effort is not succeeding, there is the risk that it could do something that it hasn't really done as much of in recent years, but has done a lot in, in the past, and that is to essentially encourage uh, violent extremists, militant groups on its soil, mm. to move into uh, Jammu and Kashmir and carry out attacks on the Indian security forces. Now, the, Pakistan is under a lot of pressure right now from the international community to crack down harder on terrorism. Uh, mm. And I think that it does worry it would not want to be accused of, of backing away from a commitment to crack down on terrorism. Mm-hmm. But if it feels particularly stressed and cornered, it doesn't feel it has any other option, it could engage in that tactic of, of, of what I would describe as uh, you know asymmetry by deploying these non-state actors into Jammu and Kashmir mm-hmm. to cause trouble. And you know the, the next time there's an attack, and I think it's a matter of when, not if, there's an attack, in India administered Kashmir that um, that kills uh, you know a large number of Indian security forces, India would automatically blame Pakistan no matter who actually and, and, they, and they have been doing that for many many years exactly mm-hmm. yeah and including earlier this year in February so if that were to happen again, India would I'm sure retaliate militarily uh, in Pakistan and if that happens that's when you have to worry about an escalatory path perhaps leading to some type of limited conflict. Sure. OK, so uh, I guess the, the other um, other um, series of activities that are happening in that region is, is the Afghan talks. And I just wanted to get your view on how much of what's happening in Kashmir is, is driven by the fact that Indian policy in in Afghanistan appears to be failing uh, with the talks uh, and, and the discussions with the Taliban between the, um, the Chinese and the Russians and the Americans. Well, it's a good question. Uh, I mean, I think there are, may, there are a number of reasons why India decided to uh, take the big step to uh, revoke Article 370. And uh, when it did, uh, I mean, it's been wanting to do this for a long time. And the ruling party, the BJP, has had the Article 370 issue in its manifestos for a long time. But I do think that the Afghanistan issue should be seen in the... Con- and it, it, there, is, there is a link to what India has done with Kashmir. And that's essentially because... As you suggested, New Delhi is very concerned about the direction of negotiations in Afghanistan, or at least until they were called off recently. It essentially saw that Pakistan was playing a significant role in the talks between the United States and the Taliban, and it saw that those negotiations between the U.S. and the Taliban were leading in a direction that would you know, hopefully uh, lead to an outcome where the Taliban would be involved in some sort of 
um, political role after there'd be a political settlement that ends the war. And that is very alarming to India because India does not want, India wants there to be a government in Afghanistan that is friendly to India. It does not want a government in Afghanistan in which the Taliban has a role. That's exactly what Pakistan wants. So I do think that India may have been concerned that Pakistan was starting to get the upper hand in Afghanistan and India thought that it could use Kashmir That's as a pressure point, so to speak, to push back against Pakistan in the broader region. So I think that there is that there is that link to uh, to keep in mind. Okay. All right. I've also got uh, Usman Zaid. He's the BBC producer, uh, BBC Pakistan producer. Uh, Asalaamu As Alaikum, Usman. Wa Alaikum Salaam. And, and welcome, welcome to Inspire FM. Uh, we've talked before, and, and welcome again well, uh, to Inspire FM. Uh, it'd be interesting to to hear from yourself uh, what the public, uh, the mood of the public in Pakistan is, I guess, uh, towards Kashmir and what's happening in Kashmir. Uh, you know, I know that there has been uh, national, uh, I, I guess, um, marches, etc. But w what's the public mood? Is it still um, as it was maybe a couple of weeks ago when, when the uh, when the Indians uh, effectively sort of um, uh, annexed uh, the, the, the Kashmir? Uh, well, public mood is, uh, you can say, it's... Uh you know, it's not, they are not feeling uh, great about the overall development, especially, you know, it's 40 days now, hmm. this, uh, you know, crackdown and siege situation in the Indian administered Kashmir. So they are like uh, quite worried about this uh, situation in the, on the other side. But in the meanwhile, I mean, they are uh, basically were expecting the government of Pakistan to do more in terms of, you know, to uh, highlighting this issue overall. Because Though Pakistan government, foreign minister, and Imran Khan himself tried doing that, but I mean they were not very successful, and uh, the international community response so far seems as muted. I mean, even from the Islamic countries like UAE, Saudi, and other men, uh, you know, the uh, from the platform of OIC, there's nothing, uh, you know, kind of concrete against the uh, India came up so far. So you know, even today, Imran Khan went to the. Muzaffarabad, the capital of Pakistan, Mr. Kashmir, where he had a big rally, and uh, you know that was, I think, another effort by Imran Khan to 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 address the sentiments of the people because you know there's a big reaction and there is a fraction of the uh, Kashmiri uh, movement which is called JKLF. This is Jammu Kashmir Liberation Front. Mm. Uh, there, uh, they had uh, in a few days ago they had a big bomb, uh, gathering. And they tried to go towards the LOC. They said we want to go and cross this LOC and uh, to help out all the uh, family members on the other side of the LOC, I mean Indian Kashmir. Mm. So Imran Khan went there, and uh, basically he, the main message he sent out, and it is in the, his speech that uh, just wait for some time, don't do this uh, crossing LOC, etc., and. Uh, I'll tell you myself when you should do this because I think he was hinting towards the that he is still hopeful that he can highlight this issue in uh, you know this uh, United Nations General Assembly which mm -hmm. is coming in next few days. So uh, that he basically trying to say that we should go and use all the diplomatic fronts and to create more pressure on India, uh, you know through this uh, international community, uh, you know, so that they can take some action against him, against India. So that, uh, you know, shows that uh, this uh, government, Pakistan, is feeling that, uh, uh, you know, people are expecting something more practical rather than just speaking and uh, just on making speeches. Okay. So, so it's, it's in interesting. Is, uh, today... Sorry, it's, it's, it's interesting to say that because uh, Michael Kuglum is on the line as well and... Uh, I mentioned to him the fact that if the diplomatic efforts of Pakistan seems to be focusing on the diplomatic side, trying to garner support from the international community. Um, but if that is not successful and there is pressure from the public for Pakistan to act, uh, uh, do you think there's a possibility of that? There, there, is, there, is there pressure to do, like you're saying, something more practical? Uh, well, you know, when we talk about the practical options, I mean, this, everyone believes that Pakistan has not much uh, kind of options that, uh, you know, in hand at the moment. Because, you know, in, if we if we go in the history and we see how it was happening, like any reaction was uh, given by these uh, 
you know, the organization which were active, like uh, they have their uh, trained people, like they were called uh, non-state actors. They were very active in the Kashmir, and uh, they used to cross over the uh, LOC. And uh, you know, the, at that time there was no box was not a defined LOC, so that they used to cross over and uh, you know do some action in that uh, uh, Indian side of Kashmir. But now, you know. We have to, uh, you know, uh, remember this timing of this whole thing when this abrogation of C-70 happened and everything. Pakistan is already under a lot of pressure from, you know, the organization like FATF and uh, international yeah, yeah, yeah. monitoring bodies. They are continually watching Pakistan that how they are, uh, you know, implementing and stopping this terror financing and all the step towards the, the, you know, militancy, etc., which are like a uh, long-standing uh, allegation on Pakistan. So their next meeting is in October. So, you know, at this point of time, I don't think Pakistan can consider any to, to kind of, uh, you know, uh, let these type of uh, activities to happen and to, because it will be a big problem again if the FATF, you know, put them on blacklist. Hmm. So Pakistan can't afford so that's why the only option left for Pakistan at this time is to highlight this on diplomatic front, mm -hmm. you know, and to uh, take, uh, take it up on all possible forums available at this moment. Mm -hmm. so that's what they are doing. And, uh, you know, so far, though, they are not very successful, but I think they are making some headway. And hopefully they are very hopeful that uh, in this general FNBA session, they will take it take it up more forcefully and uh, to convince the world and the United Nations to you know look into this matter. So, M Michael, I think this this um, this meeting of the FATF uh, that's been effectively a, um, a stick that's been used to moderate, I guess, uh, from what you're from what you're speaking uh, saying early on, the behaviour of Pakistan in, in a particular way. Uh, do you think that FATF action has encouraged India uh, to then move into Kashmir, seeing that the option that Pakistan has exercised previously, i.e. sending, uh, I guess, people who are non-state actors into Kashmir, would result in, in blacklisting? So ha has that contributed to the situation we're in in Kashmir? Well, you know, it's a good point, and I haven't really thought that through. I mean, it could be a factor, uh, but as I said earlier, I think that there are a number of other reasons why India mm. decided to act when it uh, when it did. Um, you know, one, as I mentioned before, being developments in Afghanistan, another being wanting to send a signal to President Trump, who, of course, had appeared to offer to mediate the Kashmir mm -hmm. dispute when Pakistani Prime Minister and the Colonel was in Washington a few weeks ago. I think that also just in the the, uh, the government in India wanted to um, make the move when it did for, for political reasons, wanting to make a move that would be very popular uh, across the country in anticipation of having to tackle a jobs crisis and economic problems in ways that may not be very popular with the rank and file. So I don't know. You make a very good point about India realizing that it may have a window of opportunity to to engage in something provocative, as seen by Pakistan because of an expectation that Pakistan would not would be would be constrained from uh, from engaging in its own provocations but you know the the, the issue with that argument is that I mean as, as your other guest noted the FATF is going to be meeting soon in October um, mm. and, uh, and you could argue that if Pakistan is particularly inclined to want to do something beyond uh, diplomatic moves you know let's say that it, um, you know it's uh, it's it's not black uh, or even if it is blacklisted, um, I mean, if it feels that it sort of has a sudden opportunity that it didn't earlier to try to, um, you know, deploy uh, non-state actors into Kashmir to cause trouble, it, 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 it may do that then. I mean, my own view is that Pakistan will probably not be blacklisted. Mm. Um, if it's not blacklisted, I think that it would want to still be careful in order to ensure that it, it gets taken off the gray list, which is the list it's currently on now. Well, if, uh, if it's... So if bottom it, if, line is... I, if it's blacklisted, I yeah, guess it, it probably feel that it's got no other no other options left. Uh, the international community is not listening. Well, it's been blacklisted, yeah. and I think it's just free to do what, what he wants to do. Yeah, you're right. I mean, think of either way. I mean, if it feels sufficiently desperate, there's nothing to lose. It could it could go ahead. But at the same time, I mean, Pakistan does not would not want to be on that blacklist. What that blacklist means that is that um, you know it's it's a, it's a list that has you know really the the pariahs of the world you know, that have been on it: North Korea, Iran, etc. Pakistan, as I mentioned before, is going through a very serious economic crisis. Sure. And if you end up on the FATF blacklist, 
you know, you're going to have banks and investors around the world that will not invest, and that would make Pakistan's economic problems even worse. So I would argue that if Pakistan were to be blacklisted, it would still probably be um, less likely than it would otherwise to try to um, escalate um, through through uh, through subconventional uses of force. So okay. To speak. So, um, see- but you know, at the end of the day, anything is possible. So see, seeing the, I guess the uh, potentially different motives that India might have had to uh, basically uh, uh, change the status of, of Kashmir, uh, why, why do you think um, the use of overwhelming force, blockade of the the, the Kashmiris, why is that necessary? Uh, why why, why um, India has sufficient force there? It's added to the force and it's actually f- effectively put the whole country, uh, uh, you know, under, under a curfew and, and, and blockaded it. Why, why does it need that? Well, I think it's, it's very, uh, very simple in my view. I think New Delhi knows that uh, making this move was, that was clearly going to be very unpopular by mm. Kashmiris, most of whom, uh, you know, do, have not liked the Indian state at all uh, and already feel that it was too present in their lives through this long-standing the presence of security forces, and so for many Kashmiris, being you know being told that all of a sudden they're going to become a formal part of a country that they hate, clearly that would spark unrest. I think that India was trying to preclude the possibility of mass unrest and violence from breaking out after this decision was made, and they went even further. They tried to you know they shut down communications so that you know many Kashmiris wouldn't even know what was going on. Um, mm-hmm. So I think that it's actually an indication that India knew just how provocative and unpopular this move would be, even though their public rhetoric has essentially been that this is something that, you know, will be good for Kashmir, it'll bring development and investment. And right, okay, that. Michael, I'm running out of time, so I'll have just to thank you for your contribution today. I uh, really appreciate it, uh, your insight into the South Asian region. Uh, perhaps we'll talk another occasion. Thank you very much for today. Thank you indeed. Listeners, uh, we'll you. be back after this short break. Assalamu alaikum, this is Atif Nawaz and you're listening to an Inspire FM podcast. Assalamu alaikum, welcome back. You're listening to Inspire FM, uh, Friday Night Live. Uh, this is Zafar Iqbal and with me is uh, Abu Bakr Cooper. Uh, and we were talking about the situation in Kashmir and the tensions between Pakistan and India and the possibility of an accidental war between the two countries as has been highlighted by Pakistan's foreign minister. Uh, ABC, uh, what, what's your thought on the possibility of a war between the two countries? Well, it, it's very worrying. Um, this is something that, I mean, of course, India and uh, Pakistan have gone to war together in the past, not not for some considerable time, of course. Um, but, of course, as, as a result of there being previous conflicts, it, it is always uh, there's always that sort of, there's always that palpable distrust between the two, um, and of course with this uh, previous uh, agreement of the Article Three Seventy now being revoked and ignored, and, and and them now saying that they're taking the whole region under uh, direct Indian rule with um, no remnants of uh, self-rule or autonomy. Um, Really, as an outsider looking in, I can really only see it getting worse. Mm. And what worries me is when you when you hear expert commentators say that um, Pakistan can potentially be put on the international blacklist if they're not seen to be doing more to uh, root out terrorism. I have to say, I I I I wholly think this is unfair. Mm. And mm. the reason is is if if you look at, if you look at what's gone on with uh, terrorism uh, around the world, um, it, 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 and it's it's not reported on in in the way that it should, Pakistan has had more than uh, what what you would call its fair share, as it were, of uh, to terrorism from um, Islamist groups. You know, I mean, for goodness sake, you know, I'm sure we can all remember not too long ago the school that was attacked. Indeed, indeed. You know, and of course, you know, you know, we've we've seen the events with, uh, you know, the young girl who's well, she's she's in her twenties now, isn't she, Malala, uh, mm-hmm. Yusufzai, 
Uh, and, you know, it, it just simply isn't true, this, this situation that, you know, Pakistan is, you know, not doing enough to, to root out terrorism. You know, the problem is, is that the, 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 the terrorism against the state is very, very strong. And that they're, they're dealing with that um, in a massive uh, uh, way against them. I mean, I've, I, I have students that I've taught in the past that uh, trained in uh, um, Peshawar itself. And, um, you know, I've got stories of this this young man right. that I talked to who's now a doctor of bombs going off at the ho outside the hospital there. Where we train. You know, so it's just not true. You right. know, okay. Pakistan is getting yeah. an enormous amount of terrorism Indeed. and, th and okay. they're doing a lot against it. OK, so, so that's a very good point. Uh, we're going to move on to the next topic of discussion. Uh, picking up from uh, update, uh, Brexit update, I guess, from last week, uh, we had uh, Professor Colin... Talbot again, former professor of uh, government at University of Manchester. He was on the line last week, and uh, his commentary was really well appreciated. So we brought him back. Welcome back, Professor Colin Talbot. Hi, good to be back. Thank you very much. Uh, so uh, I saw a headline today uh, in on in uh, on BBC saying Boris has said that he won't be deterred by anybody from leaving uh, the EU on the thirty first of October. His his wings have been clipped. What's what's he got? <laughs> and what's, what, what's he planning to do? I mean, he's. I don't know. He must have a bottle of Red Bull secreted somewhere about his person. I think. Um, yeah, he, I think it must be running through his veins, uh, Professor Talbot. He's uh, yeah. I mean, he, it's quite clear that there is a majority uh, in Parliament for stopping a No Deal Brexit. Yeah. Um, and that is now being put into law, hmm. uh, which he can't disobey. So he's basically got, uh, well, three choices at the moment. One is he can get a deal yeah. hmm. uh, so that he uh, doesn't have to extend the deadline. Although, uh, to be honest, even if he gets a deal, hmm. the chances of us actually leaving on October the 31st um, are fairly slim because that deal has to be put into UK law mm -hmm. and it also has to be passed through the European Parliament. But of course uh, as well, agree. Colin, of course as well, you, you actually have to be, you know, solidly negotiating to get a deal. I mean... Well, yeah, he's, he's, he's just, nipping he's, over on Monday for lunch with uh, Mr Juncker. Uh, that doesn't sound to me like very serious negotiating. I mean, there's been no, there's there's been a civil servant going to Brussels to talk about a possible deal, but there's been no ministers going over. If you know, if you thought this was very serious, you would have senior ministers, if not the prime minister himself, in well, Brussels I, I, a couple of times a week trying to negotiate the deal. See, I have to come back to this point, Colin, and. Um, wasn't the reason that they prorogued and kept Parliament closed was to have time to get everything ready for the Queen's speech so that we could have a deal? Wasn't that what he said? They're not, re they're not really linked directly. Um, but the, the, but the, the idea the, was to give time to get all of the, all of the, all of the, all of the nitty gritty done, wasn't it? That was what they were trying well, to say. Well, that's what they said. Yeah. Uh, I mean, but then nothing's sits, happening. So, sorry. Parliament sits most of the time. That doesn't stop government doing business about anything, whether it's domestic policy or international negotiations. So the idea not. that you have to close down Parliament no. in order for them to be able to get on and negotiate a deal or in order for them to prepare a Queen's speech is just total nonsense. Uh, they, they, that's the way things work normally. Governments mm -hmm. get on with doing stuff while Parliament is sitting. The only advantage to them of Parliament not sitting and being prorogued, which is Parliament completely shut down, mm. it means, for example, uh, Boris Johnson was supposed to appear be before the Liaison Committee, which is a committee of all the select committee chairs, uh, for his first appearance as Prime Minister. That was cancelled because it would have been on Tuesday um, and they prorogued Parliament. 
the Home Affairs Select Committee was supposed to have the Home Secretary in uh, this week to explain about how they were going to handle immigration and the EU 27 nationals in the UK after we leave on October the 31st. If that's what's going to happen, that didn't happen because Parliament's prorogued. So what it's effectively done is removed all scrutiny from what they're up to. Mm-hmm. Indeed. So uh, w- one thing, judging by, by the headlines, Boris Johnson's headlines, um, what's the possibility that that... Um, the extension is refused by the European Union, and therefore, by default, Britain crashes out. Uh, well, I mean, that could happen, and uh, it's important to remember that a, any extension has to be unanimously agreed by all 27 states. Yeah. So it only takes one state to say no, uh, and the extension wouldn't happen. Uh, and I think so part, it's not impossible that that could happen. Oh, yeah. So, so uh, I, I would say... So, so. Sorry, if I, could, if I go back to the point I was trying to make, that yeah. just generally, he's got three choices. He can either get a deal and he has yeah. to negotiate properly. Uh, he can ask, he can do what the law requires him to, which is if he hasn't got a deal by the time of the European uh, summit, uh, the, the heads of state summit in uh, October the 17th, 18th, uh, he has to formally ask for an extension. Mm. Or he can resign. Uh, which has also been floating around, that he could resign as Prime Minister and say, well, I'm not going to do it uh, if, if an extension is asked for by whoever takes over from me. Um, we're going to then try and force a general election and I'll try and get elected on a ticket of uh, taking us out as soon as I'm back in office. Okay. Professor Tolbert, I have to ask you this. In the light of the uh, ruling from Scotland, what is the opinion from um, uh, legally legal academia on this issue, on the legality of the it, proroguing? I mean, is yeah, it's very it's very difficult. There is no law that, as such, because we don't have a written constitution. There's no uh, law about what happens with prorogation of parliament, really, um, and what constitutes a legal or an illegal prorogation of parliament. There's been understandings, what are known as conventions, about it. Uh, And in the last, certainly since the Second World War, prorogation's never been more than a few days. And it's basically, uh, I can't remember if I said this last week, but it's basically a sort of reset for Parliament. It's Mm -hmm. like rebooting your computer. Uh, Cleans out all the stuff that's in the system, and they start again with a new Queen's speech, a new legislative agenda, Um, all the old parliamentary questions, old bills that haven't been passed yet, all get dropped and you have to restart everything, nearly everything. There's one or two things carry on. Mm. Um, So normally it only lasts for a few days. Now this is clearly been done for five weeks in order to make sure that MPs aren't around uh, during a critical phase Mm -hmm. uh, of the negotiations and leaving them with only two weeks or so in the second half of October to do anything uh, about crashing out. And the prorogation, ironically, the prorogation actually triggered all the opposition parties and the 21 Tories who were kicked out of the the Conservative Party, getting together to pass the Act, which now compels him to ask for an extension if he doesn't get a deal. That probably wouldn't have happened uh, before the parliamentary recess if they hadn't done the prorogation. So it's backfired quite spectacularly on them. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, so, so the, the law, uh, the, the judgment the Scottish sort of judge passed, uh, I, yep. I guess is, I mean, Scot- Scottish legal system, how, how does that interface with, with the UK? Not- yeah, not. I mean, <laughs> Scottish law and the and English and Welsh law, which is what covered by the court, the High Court in London, yeah. uh, are not materially different around issues around the Constitution. Mm. And there were there were two issues involved in in this. The first issue is, can the courts say anything at all about whether or not the Prime Minister has given. Uh, lawful or unlawful advice to the Queen about proroguing Parliament. Mm. And the difference of opinion, uh, the first difference of opinion was on that matter. So the Scottish court said, yes, they can, uh, because it would be unreasonable for there to be no judicial review at all of any prorogation 
mm. advice that the Prime Minister gave. So, for example, if he'd gone to the Queen and said, I want to prorogue Parliament until 2022, uh, and I'm yeah. just going to rule by diktat, you know, that clearly would have been yeah. unconstitutional one in anybody's book. So the question is, you know, at what point does a, a prorogation become something that the courts can decide on? And the High Court in London said they couldn't make any decision. The court in Scotland said they did. Then the second bit of the question was, once you've decided the court can uh, make an adjudication on it, the Scottish court looked at all the papers and they requested and got quite a lot of papers which were uh, not in the public domain before and they looked at them all and said well the reason that was given for the prorogation which is to prepare for the Queen's speech is patent nonsense that's not what it was about it was about closing down Parliament whilst these uh, whilst this critical period is taking place um, now what the government's been saying is oh well the High Court in London agreed with us well they didn't actually what but all the High Court in London said was we can't make a decision about the matter they didn't say Boris Johnson was telling the truth or not telling the truth mm -hmm. because they never looked at it and and, and the, I guess that even the Scottish ruling in that case doesn't really amount to much apart from the fact that that they've said he uh, a truth wasn't told effectively so uh, they, no, it does, uh, I mean, in law, until that judgment is set aside, the prorogation should okay. be cancelled and Parliament should be resuming. And the only reason that hasn't happened is because the government sought leave to appeal against the Scottish judgment right. and the uh, Gina Miller and co. in London had sought leave to appeal against the High Court judgment and the Supreme Court said it will hear both of them next week. Uh, essentially as one case. So nothing further has been done, but it would have been possible for um, the people who'd taken Joanna Cherry and the others who'd taken the case in Scotland to have gone back to the court and asked for a court order mm. uh, to get Parliament re un unparoged mm. and, and recalled. Okay, right. So it is effective then. It's not just an exercise of... Yeah, yeah. No, and, and, and I mean, also, if, it, if it's proved that... Um, uh, that, uh, I mean, there's all sorts of issues fall out of this. I mean, it's potentially possible if it's proved that the Prime Minister gave uh, false and misleading advice to the monarch, which resulted in actions which led to loss to, for example, companies preparing uh, for no-deal Brexit, they could potentially take civil action against well, the government hmm. for loss of money. Indeed. Um, so there's all sorts of things that could happen Indeed. as a consequence. Okay. So can I can I just go back to the question I said about what, what if the what if the European Union doesn't agree uh, to an extension? Yep. Uh, and, and and I was going to say that that maybe uh, the, the one of the countries that that might be tempted to pull out is maybe Hungary. I think it's been making all sorts of different noises. So what, what's mm -hmm. the what's the possibility that that the European Union doesn't act in unison and and which results in Britain crashing out? Uh, well, it's quite possible, but of course that uh, that's not the end of the story because sure. the day after we left, so starting November the 1st, yeah. we would have to start renegotiating all of the things, not just trade agreements, but all of the other security, airlines, mm -hmm. all the other issues. Uh, we would start. We would start renegotiating them, and the EU have made it perfectly clear if we did leave without a deal on October the 31st, the first question they would ask when we went back to them to say, well, we we need to negotiate a trade deal and all these other things would be, where's our 39 billion? Right. Okay. Where's the agreement about the EU nationals in the UK? And where's the agreement about the Irish border? Mm -hmm. So we'd just be back to square one. Yeah, okay. Except we'd be outside with all the disruption that that would cause. Mm, indeed, indeed. What worries me in all this is, is looking at it. If if things go the government's way, and the Supreme Court um, says that this ruling of the Scottish uh, uh, laws, uh, law lords, isn't to be upheld, it's just going to be. It's just going to be more fuel um, towards damaging the union of the United Kingdom for and for for Scotland to looking to leave the union. I mean, there's there, there's 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 <laughs> there's just no there's just no positive outcome from this. Indeed, indeed. At this stage well, I, now, I, I can't I, see a positive outcome. 
I think I think you're being a little bit too gloomy. Um, I, even if the prorogation goes ahead and the Supreme Court says it sets aside that judgment, I mean, I think it will make a marginal difference in Scotland. But to be honest, I think Scottish opinion is has hardened anyway already, mm-hmm. and that's not going to affect that very much. Um, but and it won't. You know, there will still be the law is still on the statute book saying that Johnson has to. Uh, either agree a deal or ask for an extension. Parliament will be back in session from when the Queen's speech happens on the 16th, is it? Um, uh, And we'll be able to take action on that. The Speaker, uh, in a speech yesterday, made it very clear that he will do everything possible to facilitate making sure that the government is held to the law that's been passed. And they have no working majority. I mean, they're actually they're actually on minus 44 at the moment, wow. I think, mm. uh, in terms of having any sort of majority in the House of Commons. So they, uh, the, there's very little chance of them overturning um, the law that's been passed or getting anything else done. So I, I think, I mean, we're going to have a very serious, potentially constitutional crisis, certainly a political crisis, yeah. and possibly an economic crisis if we uh, do end up crashing out on the 31st, which I is mean, it, it, still it's not lit- possible. It's literally like watching the opposition forcing the government to stay in government, but to constantly to its line, its beck and call. It, it, it's like them governing by proxy. It, it, it really does, mm. you know, it's... it's it's beyond anything, re- really, that I think has ever happened in uh, political history in this country. Mm. Well, certainly in modern history, yeah. Uh, but it's what happens if you have a minority government. Mm. Um, that, that It's very difficult for them to get anything done. Um, in this particular situation, uh, the Fixed Term Parliament Act means it's impossible for... You know, I mean, in the past, what would have happened in a situation like this, it happened in the 1970s, for example, with the Wilson government. They would have called a second general election in uh, 1974. There were two general elections in the same year. Um, and they would have called a general election to try and resolve the issue. But the, the Prime Minister can no longer do that without the permission of Parliament, and he doesn't have a majority in Parliament to force it through. Mm. Um, and, well, I mean, I think we all know the arguments that the, the reason the opposition wouldn't vote for calling a general election immediately is because he gets to fix the date. Mm. So he could say in Parliament, well, we're going to have an election on October the 16th, which was the mm. date that was floating around. But then once the vote had gone through, he could say, well, actually, I've changed my mind. It's going to be November the 1st mm. and we'll be out of the European Union. And that's mm. why the opposition parties wouldn't vote for it. Yeah. So, so what, what, one thing I wanted to ask is, if, if you were to just to balance the argument a little bit, and and just say for for, for argument's sake that uh, this proroguing uh, is meant to give the uh, the I guess the leadership a bargaining chip. The fact that you know the Parliament is arguing in itself is weakening its position in some people's eyes, um, and and uh, this quiet period uh, basically gives them time to strategize and maybe put put the pressure on the European Union to. Then move on their position. Basically, what, what, what's uh, is there any, 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 that, any? Yeah, I mean that that would have made sense, uh, and I think would have been true if mm. uh, they hadn't moved twice in the House of Commons to call to try and call a general election and made it clear that they will they now want a general election because that's completely. Yes, uh, yes. Cut the legs out from under the government in any negotiations. Why is the EU going to negotiate with somebody who might not be in government? Indeed, indeed. Uh, in the very near future, because there's going to be a general election. Mm. Uh, and it would be utterly bizarre now if, if the uh, Conservative Party decided it was going to vote against calling a general election when uh, when they've been asking for it. And the opposition have made it perfectly clear that once there's an extension in place, on uh, Article 50, so to, till the end of January, as the bill uh, requires, the Act re- requires, uh, they will vote for a general election. So there's almost, 
you know, there's 99% certain we're going to have a general election in November. So what incentive is there for the EU to negotiate? Control, yes. yes, that's a good point, mm. really good mm. point. So is, is that what you think the outcome is going to be in the sense that there's not a I, lot? My, my guess at the moment, um, but to be honest, you know, it is a guess. So <laughs> it may be an informed guess, but it's still a guess, uh, mm. is that we will end up having an extension uh, through some mechanism till the end of January, and there will be a general election. And to be honest, I don't think a general election will sort anything out because on current polling figures, I can't see any of the parties getting majority. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, we could end up with a more hung parliament than we've got at the moment. Even more hung parliament. But but yeah. I think uh, Jeremy's point, point of view, which is to maybe uh, have a general election on the basis that there is a, um, an offer on the table of, of some sort of an agreement. Um, how, 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 I guess, how uh, valid is that, is that opinion? You mean Jeremy Corbyn? Jer Jeremy you. Corbyn, that's right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, to, I, to be honest, I find it very difficult to get my head round Labour's position. I mean, as, as far as I can see, the official Labour position is they want to have a general election, become the government, negotiate a new withdrawal agreement with the EU, yeah. and then put that to a ballot, uh, to a, a new referendum, referendum mm. in which the choice will be Remain or their new deal, and they're not saying which one they'll vote for or campaign mm. for, or whether they'll campaign for either. Mm. Um, now, again, as the people from the EU have made it very clear, so why would we negotiate on that basis? If we, we, we'd get to negotiate a deal with the Corbyn government... Mm. We expect them to try and push that deal through. Why should we make any concessions at all mm. uh, to you if you're not going to actually recommend it and campaign for it? Mm, um, okay. So I, I just I don't understand Labour's position think, at all. I mean, I think give they're, they're they're trying to play both halves, mm. uh, both sides against the middle, and at the moment they're just. Uh, I mean, they're I think, losing I think votes the time quite is, heavily to Lib Dems and the Brexit Party. Yeah, I think the time is that, that they do need to commit to a clear opinion. I mean, I mean, the the point that they're saying that it should that it should be put to the people is valid, um, but I do agree with you completely. You know, at least make a decision. You know, if 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 your diagnosis is to the ill that we should um, stay in, then say what your diagnosis is to the to to the illness. If your diagnosis is is okay, we're going to have a deal, and this is the answer to the solution. Say what you think the remedy remedy to the patient's illness is. You know, I agree with you completely. Yeah. Sit, sitting on sitting on the fence and not saying that this is the party stance and this is what we're advising to the electorate, you know, they, they have got to make a decision. Yeah, just a, a final few minutes, a few seconds we've got, actually, we've got about 30 seconds or so, if you wouldn't okay. mind summing up, uh, Professor Colin, it's been fascinating again today, as it was last week. Sure, I mean, I, as I say, I, I think we're heading, we're obviously heading for a crunch at the end of October, um, we'll see what the Supreme Court decides next week, but it's quite possible Parliament will still be suspended until the middle of October, um, and by then we'll know whether or not the government is seriously going for a deal or they're seriously going for crashing out, and then mm -hmm. the confrontation will be in Parliament between those who want to prevent no deal and the government trying to push it through. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Colin. Thank you indeed. That's OK. Thanks. You're listening to an Inspire FM podcast, making available our popular programmes from our daily broadcast on Inspire FM. Welcome, welcome back. You're listening to Inspire FM, 105.1 FM. This is Friday Night Live. Uh, my name is Safar Kabal, and I've got uh, Abu Bakr Cooper with me as a uh, co-presenter. We were talking to Professor Colin Talbot before the break, and he was giving us uh, his views basically on the Brexit and pro proration, prorogation, pro the prorogation, prorogation of, of Parliament and the, the legal view uh, that some of the judges have, have pronounced on it. So there is a possibility next week that the Parliament will be recalled again. Uh, and uh, depending on what, what, what the judgment uh, holds. 
And the view of Professor Collins is that there is bound to be an election, but the election is going to be messy. It will return uh, even more hung Parliament. Is that your view, ABC? It, gosh, I, I, I really have... Uh, if, if, if you asked me how things were going to be um, back in January, I would, would have said, yeah, we will be out by um, the 31st of March, blah, 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 blah. Um, uh, yeah, uh, I, I, I mean, for goodness sake, we've just, sp we've just spoken to uh, a professor of one of the top universities of the country on, on you know, on, on legal thought and, uh, and, and how things work. And, you know... When you speak to someone of that stature and, and they can't see exactly or predict in any way how things are moving forward, it really does make you realise how much of a crisis we're in. Mm -hmm. And it really is a crisis, you know, and we really need to understand that because there, there's literally no government at the moment. Nothing, nothing is happening. And things are t to the degree where... You know, it makes you wonder, you know, uh, should there be some sort of provision, you know, I, I don't mean in terms of, of dictating opinion, you know, but should we have something, you know, where uh, coupled with the speaker and the monarch to request, not demand, of course, because that, that would be undemocratic, democratic, but to request an audience with the leaders of the main parties with uh, a private session you know, so, so things can actually start be worked out towards a solution, and and if that can't be done, perhaps there's you know we really should think should in such a crisis as as this, you know, uh, with agreement of the speaker, you know, perhaps you know the, could, the army coming in. <laughs> well, no, well, well, no, th this is the whole problem. You know, for decades, for centuries in this country, they've thought, no, the British system is so good. We know what the British constitution is. We, we work on tradition and tradition has done us good and proper and it's going to work and it will always work. And, you know, we, 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 we compare now the situation we're in and we look across the pond to America and it really makes you realise uh, mm, maybe we really should have a written constitution, right? You know? okay. and, and maybe this is something that uh, our parliamentarians in the future should really look at. Because I really can see that that, that and unless that uh, unless Parliament is dissolved, and there's going to be um, immediately, and there's going to be solid, strong campaigning towards how this is going to be sorted out. And let's face it. The politicians can't make up their mind. Half the politicians are now saying that everything should be put back to the people. And you've got the other half saying, no, the, it must be respected, blah, 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 blah. We've got a situation where we've got a potential um, complete loss of the Good Friday Agreement and the peace that was was hard, hard, worked hard for for, for decades, you know, and, and th those of us that can remember it, you know, pe innocent people being killed because of the conflict, yeah, yeah. that being risked. We've now got the union of the whole country being risked all over this issue. Mm. And... It is more important. It is more important than to say, right? You cannot have uh, put it to the people because we are right. We've we've got this in our grasp. We've got this Brexit in our grasp, and we're not going to let it go. Well, I, I I put it to the the people that are behaving like this, running the country now. Is it worth risking? That's the, a, that's a good is question. it worth risking that long struggled for peace in Northern yeah, Ireland? It's a good, it's is a good, it worth risking the union of our country very emotional, but that I has have been to here since 1707? Yeah, well, no, but this is the way we need to look at it. Sure, because, agree, agree. because this is what they are failing to hold together. Yeah, it, sure. it really is the most important things in how our country works and has its peace. Right, OK, so we're... You, you, I think you made your point very clear. You're very passionate about this. Uh, we have to move on to part B of, of our organ donation uh, discussion we started off with. We, we spoke to Dr. Mansur Ali uh, uh, around 6 o'clock, and he gave us an Islamic perspective uh, on uh, organ donation. Uh, we have now 
uh, Dr. Nigath Arif, uh, who uh, I guess is going to tell us a little bit about, uh, you know, how important, uh, I guess, organ donation is uh, because her son benefited from it. Uh, Asalaamu Alaikum, Dr. Nigath. Asalaamu Alaikum. Thank you so much for having me on. Not a problem. Thank you for taking time out and, and discussing this very important issue with us. Uh, so the, the the notes I've got here is that you're a, you're a GP in Buckinghamshire uh, and your 10-month-old son and needed a transplant. Uh, and without that, he wouldn't have survived. Uh, yeah. Can you give us a little bit more on that, please, if you wouldn't mind? So um, Gossim is our second child, yeah. and so our first one was absolutely fine and mm. healthy. We decided to have a second one. Gossim was about three weeks old. Sure. He turned yellow. We took, it, I took him to the GP. Being a GP myself, I knew something wasn't right straight mm. away um, because he was, although thriving really well, I yeah. spoke to uh, my colleague and said, let's organize some blood tests. Mm. We got those done on the same day, and that evening I got a phone call from Stoke Mandeville Hospital, which is our local hospital, and they said, your child's liver function is very deranged, so that means it's really badly um, affected. Oh dear. And his clotting factor is six. Mm -hmm. The normal clotting factor for everybody is about one. Right. And his, his was six, and he's at a high risk of having an internal bleed and oh even dear. death. Okay. So we got blue lighted up to King's College Hospital, which is a pediatric unit for liver function, uh, mm. liver uh, diseases. And he had a liver biopsy. Mm. It was um, after the biopsy that they told me that he has this really rare liver condition, which uh, he'll probably need a transplant by the time he's five years old. Right. And if he doesn't get a transplant, he's more likely to get liver cancer because oh, he has a 50% okay. chance of getting that. Mm -hmm. um, as a parent, I my world fell apart because this wasn't something I was expecting. Sure, I yeah. had expected to go back to work after maternity leave. I work in a very busy NHS practice mm. uh, in Buckinghamshire. So you start thinking about all the practicalities of life as well as having a, a sick child. But also when he said you need a transplant, how uh, I knew very little even as a GP. How do I even go about looking for a yeah, transplant? Yeah. Mm. So we first, uh, and also the ethics and the religious factors about it, and luckily your uh, earlier uh, caller tackled a lot of that for me already. Mm, but right. we we had, I'd always been aware of transplantation. I mean, uh, as a medic, we counsel families who've lost their loved ones in A&E through terrible, terrible circumstances. Sure. Um, but also, to in order to get a trans successful transplant, you need a blood match and a tissue match. Sure. So Gartan was B positive. Mm. Um, and they put us on the organ donor list when he was about six, four, four months old, because it was it was becoming quite clear that his liver function wasn't getting better. Mm -hmm. And liver, the liver is great because it always tries to reheal itself. But every single time it does that, there's always a mistake that happens. Oh, okay. And he started becoming swollen up. He couldn't breathe. He was having nosebleeds. He was vomiting. He couldn't hold his sugars because the liver does over a hundred jobs. Mm -hmm. And as he deteriorated, he, we were in and out of hospital constantly. Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, he then collapsed. Okay. And then when he was about 10 months old, he started getting growths on his liver. And mm -hmm. it was becoming apparent that we need a transplant Amazing, quickly yeah. because he's got liver cancer. Oh, my God. Okay. He was 10 months old. And, and you, you were fortunate uh, enough to find a match. And, uh, well... We waited and waited on the list for so long, mm. um, and we still hadn't found a match. So the doctors gave us 24 hours, and if we didn't find a match, then or someone from our family donated. So we desperately looked around, and I was a match. Okay. Um, but also, in this country, they don't do many live donor um, transplants. So mm. just from a living person to a living person, because the risk of death is so high. Right. You right. have to cut the liver in half. Okay. And I had a four-year-old child at home. I might need to have future babies, sure, um, indeed, I'm indeed, a mother, yeah. uh, my career is going to stop, I, I might not be able to work uh, through mm -hmm. having a, a, a major, major surgery. So they they weren't happy to put me under surgery when I'm a healthy, yes, but yes. as a mother, I was desperate. I was I wanted them to take any organ as long as my child lived. Oh, yeah, okay. But we don't have many mm. uh, donors from ethnic minorities, and you can only find certain blood groups and tissue groups within our own communities. Mm. But Alhamdulillah, we, within the last 24 hours, we got a phone call to say that there's a O positive match, mm. which our son could potentially have. Indeed, okay. So then we waited and waited, and he could ha receive that. It wasn't a, a direct match, mm -hmm. but it was something, at least it was universal. Sure. And it meant that I didn't have to go under surgery myself. Indeed, okay. And, 
So, so, so essentially, this... that donor family saved my life and my child's life by mm. donating their 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 son's organs, and not just my child's life. Eight other people that they saved eight, with their babies. Eight. Eight. So yeah. so so in total, it's total nine children. Yeah, I mean eight, eight including Gatsim. Uh, Gatsim. So seven other children. So, seven sorry, other seven people, other children. Because they, seven. I think they donated a heart. Uh, I think the only thing mm. from many, this is months and months and years later, because it was in 2016 this all happened, mm. when I spoke to the transplant coordinator, because as a mother, I felt incredibly uh, close to that, this anonymous mother, because I don't know who they are, there's, a, it's, there's strict rules, you don't know who the donor family is ever. Mm. Yeah. But for her child, her child did nothing wrong, he was a young boy, he went out on his bike, fell off his oh. bike and hit the back of his head. Oh my word. All he did was go on his bike on a how many how many of us do that with mm, our children? Yeah, our yeah, our children, yeah. we let them play. So he did nothing wrong at all and he ended up dying that day but was the right blood group. And the parents, how those parents had the heart to say, Okay, my child has died but I can give someone else life mm, I think giving eight people life new life plays a huge role. Mm. Yeah, indeed, indeed. And there's kindness and there's good people who are willing to do that and if we as Muslims are willing to receive, I think we have to be able to give back. Or just on a humanitarian level, I don't think I can ever live with the fact that I can't reciprocate sure. such a humanity act, knowing what we've been through. Indeed. Because waiting on that list, it kills you. You yeah. can't do anything for your well, child but wait. This is what I was saying a little bit earlier with uh, Zafar Doctor. Is uh, just I think it was two, two and a half weeks ago, I had to renew my driving license and it came through with the... Mm details about being a donor and it actually gave information on there from a Brit British Islamic scholar and mm. I can remember times when, when I was first Muslim when people said oh you can't do donation so I thought oh, okay so so I, so I looked up and I found an, a number of opinions saying that you know that it's acceptable um, because mm. of to, to put because of the raw saving a life and uh, so forth um, so I thought about it and and exactly the argument you said if it was one of my children mm. uh, would I say yes to accept a donation and of course instantly the answer is yes and I thought about it and I thought mm. well if I'm not going to say yes to this I'm a hypocrite so I'm, I went ahead with it so I've got my yeah. card sitting with me here in my wallet Oh, you're my hero. Thank you. The, the thing is, is that if we look at just pure statistics, not just my case and get emotional about it, but last year in 2018, there was 1,800 people from black, Asian, ethnic minority people yeah. waiting for a transplant. One in five of those people on those lists died before they even got a transplant. Yeah. And a lot of people, because they waited so long, yeah. other, other organs started failing. So with our son, Qasim, he waited for six months and he got liver cancer. And he didn't need to get liver cancer. True. He, we knew he needed an organ transplant when he was six weeks old. Mm -hmm. But because we waited and waited and waited, he ended up cancer, getting cancer. And now, every three to six months, he has big scans. He's only four years old to make sure that there's no cells left behind. That could have been preventable. Mm -hmm. That was a preventable condition mm -hmm. that he didn't need to have. Good. And so if the scholars just get together, and um, luckily that they are, and be able to give a... Awareness such as this, which you're doing, so I'm so, so grateful to you guys for allowing me to come on, because if we just have this awareness and let people talk about it, mm. and then share their wishes about donating, mm. it's really important because you can prevent people from getting worse conditions sure. um, later on in life, and, and that's the, the biggest factor, because if you, if, as a community, those are our statistics, we're more likely to get, as a GP, I see Asian people with diabetes, mm. heart disease, uh, certain hepatitises, and those conditions affect our organs. So mm -hmm. it might not be you now that needs an organ, but your relative might need a kidney mm -hmm. because of high blood pressure yeah, of course. many years on. And, and we are living longer, and we have to be able to work as a community with the NHS on controversial, difficult subjects like organ donation mm -hmm. because we don't talk about it. Nobody in our community knows about it, even the process of it. Mm -hmm. Because even if you sign the organ donor register, at the end, if you don't tell your family your wishes, they can override that once you pass away. Because if your family say no, especially the elders, I see that a lot as well, mm -hmm. that the younger generation are more learned and educated. And if they, God forbid, passed away from an accident, then the elders come in and they say, no, it's against Islam or this mm -hmm. person didn't want it. But they haven't actually discussed that 
at all. So it's really important that if you sign the register that you let your family know so they can respect your wishes and honour what you wanted to do. Mm. Because so organs uh, are taken with great dignity and respect. So uh, on, on, yeah. on the question of match, um, mm. so I, I guess uh, there are a number of different factors, I guess, which, which are at play to get a, a, the right match. I guess blood yeah. group is one. Uh, yeah, but what's, what's Right, okay. And is, is so that... Is, group. Sorry, go. Sorry, I'm interrupting you. No, no, you go, you go. I was just going to say, basically, is is tissue group the factor which requires that, that there's somebody of the similar background uh, being available, yeah. is it? Yeah, exactly. So, um, because uh, we have certain, uh, there's HLA markers so within our immune system. There are certain markers that allow um, other immune systems from a particularly similar genetic pool hmm. that we are more receptive to. Hmm. Um, so you will only find those within Asian groups as well. And that, therefore, because organs, they are foreign objects, your immune system will automatically try and reject it hmm. and destroy it. So if we get an immune system or tissue match or HLA match, which is relatively compatible, sure. then that organ will survive longer and your body won't reject it. Mm. So that's why they we try and look for within the same ethnic groups if we can. That doesn't say we can't have people from white groups. We can. But it just means that you, there might be a high risk of rejection. And that is one thing that once you've had surgery, you don't want rejection. Because Garson had rejection. He had it last year. Mm. And then we had to give him four rounds of chemotherapy. To wow. help him with that, so I've gone through rejection as well with my son, mm. and it's it's not an easy road at mm. all. Mm. So, um, so how, how is he faring now? Then is his four year four year old? You're saying, is he? Oh, Alhamdulillah, he's so good now. He I, you'd never think this is a child who's had chemotherapy about a year ago, um, who's had sepsis after sepsis, who's wow. had a liver wow. transplant. He's he's starting he started school for the first time this year. Uh, he goes to full-time school. He's on medication to prevent rejection. So mm, he takes mm. medicines in the morning and medicines in the evening. And they're pretty powerful medicines sure. to put his immune system to sleep. So he will be on that for life. Mm. But the alternative, yes, as a indeed, mother, yeah. isn't bare thinking about because I wasn't ready to bury my child. No mother's ready to bury her absolutely, child. Absolutely, absolutely. But um, the alternative, and I just want to say that as a donor family, I am so grateful for them. How they had the heart and humanity to say yes that day mm. has completely changed, your changed life, yeah. my life. Indeed. And and we should, as, as Muslims, mm. we should be able to reciprocate that because our faith is embedded in humanity, embedded in love and respect and honour. Mm. And surely we should be able to have these difficult conversations. Indeed, indeed. As a doctor, I'm going to be really selfish, obviously, mm. um, and say there are preventable conditions. The NHS is better when we prevent conditions because it costs less in the, in the long run uh, and better outcomes for patients as well. well no, I, th I think you're doing the right thing. We, when, when we've clearly got now so many mainstream scholars um, uh, giving their opinion, you know, that, that, it's, that it's allowed, it's halal, it's rewardable, you know, it, 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 mm. it is good for um, professionals like you to, to make us aware. Because, the, uh, of course, the, the thing is, on this issue, if uh, a healthcare professional like yourself can, can s speak to a patient asking, well, doctor, what do you think about this? You know, and if you can say, well, th this is what um, different scholars have, have, have said, and, mm -hmm. you know, because they are there on the N NHS site, I've seen them, um, mm -hmm. that is all, you know, truthful information going forward to help people to make informed decisions. And let's face yeah. it, uh, it's like I said, when I was looking at the decision and I was thinking about it, and what was the overriding thing for me to get over it? And, and I thought, well, OK, if it was for, for, for my son Zane or my daughter Alia, I wouldn't hesitate to say, yes, I will accept the, the cool. donation in an emergency. And, and of course, well, well if, 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 if you're willing to accept, then if the scholars are saying that it's allowed, then surely we should be queuing up to earn the reward. Because after all, one of the one of the greatest things is that we can do is to save a life. And of course, yeah. if we make that decision while we're alive and that happens with our organs and we're still saving a life, inshallah ta'ala, we're still getting mm. that hasanat, the reward uh, coming forward to us in our afterlife. Indeed, indeed. Mm. So, and so, the other argument so that do I get please, also is people... 
do please right. be positive uh, with your patients if, if, if people ask because the, the more your patients know if they can make an informed decision it, it, it's, it's helping them to, if okay if they decide no they decide no but if it, at least then uh, they can make an informed decision yeah and especially next year when spring 2020 comes in uh, there's going to be everyone is going to be considered a donor unless they opt out so that's it's going to be law that everybody is considered a donor unless they opt out and people need to have that education and make that informed decision the other argument that i get from a lot of people is that oh um there's two types of deaths in medicine uh, so we have a brainstem death so as doctors if your if your brain is dead then we consider that as death even if your heart is still beating but in islam i believe that uh, there's more emphasis on the heart death so if your heart stops beating then in Islam you're considered as dead. And now the technology and the medical advancements are so amazing that even after your heart has stopped beating and the rule has gone, so the spirits have gone, mm. is that they can retrieve organs after that. Mm. Which we so medicine has has advanced so much that we are trying to meet the Islamic scholars and Islamic texts mm. in order to be able to respect uh, the mm. person's faith, um, their wishes. Um, and also be keeping in with Islam as much as possible. Indeed, excellent. Uh, so the, the other question I, I wanted to, uh, to ask about uh, from a match perspective, I think the earlier, uh, uh, the earlier sort of um, uh, uh, Dr. Mansour we had, had earlier on, he was saying that, that getting a match is, you, know, you talked about tissue matches and you talked about blood group matches, but it's also the fact that the person has to be in a particular location, has to be in hospital and in sort of emergency mm. care before you could take an organ out. Is that is that still the case, or, or is that? Well, like there's a national register now, so what that means is that all the hospitals across the whole of the UK talk to each other because right. uh, when someone goes on a list, um, all the hospitals are aware. Okay. So if there is a death, so I think our donor, um, I'm not too sure. I came from around Leeds, mm -hmm. um, and so uh, all the hospitals where they do transplants, they would they have a helicopter that goes out and retrieves it because we have something called the golden hour. Yeah. So yeah. within the hour. We try and get the organ to where the person is waiting to receive it, sure, because yeah. then obviously the healthier the the tissues are, the, uh, the the organ is, then the better the transplant quality will be. So you're right. There's a geographical, but the 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 blood and NHS blood and trans and transplant services are fantastic because they've set up this national service mm. where they talk to each other constantly. And I've got two friends who are surgeons are, as a part of that, and they fly out at two o'clock in the morning four o'clock in the morning, regardless of wherever they find an organ, they will fly out and they will constantly do that. The thing is, is the demand is higher for people waiting on the list mm -hmm. than the people willing to donate, particularly from ethnic minorities. What, what about age, age groups? Is that is that uh, a difference as well? So, if, for example, your child, you are prepared to give mm -hmm. your uh, liver. Would, would that, isn't the, isn't the size? So you can, in this country, you can only freely go on the organ uh, donation register after the age of 18, because that's right. usually when people get their driving license, and that's when it comes up as, uh, um, because with your sound mind. But younger than that, um, relatives are always approached and asked. Even older than that, so if you're 18 and above, and God forbid you had an accident, the hospital doctors and the staff, the transplant staff, will always ask your relatives. And if your relatives override your registration, that's fine. They will respect your relatives' wishes. Mm. So that's why it's so important to have that conversation before anything happens to us. So I always say to my patients, make sure you have your will in order. If you want to be on the donor register, make sure you tell your pa pa parents and your family that this is what you want to do um, before you die. Because... It's indeed, hard indeed. to do those things. No, no, the, the point the point I was trying to make is is the fact that if you've got a ten month old child and you've got an adult mm. who's fifty years old, would would his liver still be I guess considered for for donation to a ten, ten so, month old? So they try they try and match uh, ages with ages. So they try right, and give. Also, but yeah. Um, yeah, but the great thing about some organs, like particularly, so you can have half of an adult liver given to a child because the liver will grow. By itself. Right. So it depends on organs. It really does depend on organs. So um, they will try and uh, uh, if you've got a 50 year old man they'll, who who donates a kidney, that kidney might not fit a 10 month old mm. baby just sure. because of the size of the baby. Sure, sure. So it, it has to be a, an age compatibility as sure. well. Okay, uh, Dr. Nigat, uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to leave it there, running out of time. So oh, thank, thank you so much for having me on. Thank oh, you. Thank, thank you. you for your contribution today.
Have a lovely weekend with uh, Carson. Yes, indeed. Right, okay, Thanks. listeners, uh, that's the end of the show today for this Friday. Jazakallah had for listening, if you were listening. If you haven't listened, then listen to the podcast, which is available tonight. Uh, if not, then listen to the repeat tomorrow, Saturday, around about midday time. Until next week, assalamu alaikum. Thank you for listening to our podcast. We stream our daily broadcast on inspirefm.org. You'll find all our daily updates on our social media at inspirefmluton.